So welcome to this evening's Centre for the History of People, Place and Community seminar, which is going to be given by Sophie Peng. Sophie is a textile historian who is currently an affiliate research at Glasgow University. She specialises in the study of lace, knitting, cultural semiotics theory and intangible cultural heritage in the Nordic Baltic zone. In her PhD thesis, which she completed in the Central and East European Studies and History Departments at the University of Glasgow in 2023, congratulations, Sophie, um, she used qualitative ethnographic data together with archival materials to explore the meanings of hand-knitted wooden lace and its role in constructing and shaping local identities in Shetland, in Scotland, and Harpsalu in Estonia. Sophie is now serving on the Committee for the Nordic Baltic Network on Intangible Cultural Heritage and has previously held visiting PGR fellowships at the University of Helsinki and the University of Tartu. Sophie is going to be speaking um, this evening about symbolising lace on recognisability and visibility of lace as heritage craft in Shetland and Harpsalu landscapes. So with no further ado, over to you Sophie. Thank you so much, Ruth. I just want to double check. Uh, can everyone hear me? I hope I'm not muting myself. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this seminar. So today I'm just going to present part of my PhD thesis, the empirical chapter, like two themes out of five themes in total. And so let me see. I will share my screen now. Share. Does it work? Oh, right. OK. Play slideshow, right? So um, today I'm just going to talk about um, how lace becomes a symbol of, and how lace serves as a symbol in Shetland hops, not only landscapes, but also cultural landscapes. Um, I just want to give some background information before I start the actual part, because, um, well, I guess uh, uh, most of you probably are from the UK, so you will know where Shetland is. It's on the north, more like everything most northerly of this country happened to be in Shetland. Um, but Harpsalu, I just want to give um, a little bit background information. It's a small resort town, well, not so small on Estonia scale, but quite small um, if you're from a place like the UK, I mean. And it's on the west coast of Estonia, and it, it has got a history of being the, um, well, most recently in the 19th century, Hapsal is famous for being the mud spa resort. So it's a place you just take care of, uh, like, just for ho ho holiday goers and for those who want to spend quiet time in the countryside on the seashore. And why I put Shetland and Hapsal together as, um, uh, comparative cases i'll explain a um, little bit but first of all let's go through this outline of my presentation today uh, because it's really hard to just talk about a really small part of my whole phd thesis so uh, i will first just go really really quickly like the abstract of ab abstract of my phd project and then i will define what is this recognizability and the visibility that I'm talking about tonight. And then I'll go back to the backbone of my, uh, the theory part of this uh, PhD project that is semiotics. And by the way, I, um, although I was never a student of Dartu semiotic department, but I've been, uh, I did part of my master at Dartu University. And then I worked at Dartu University as a visiting researcher. So I could maybe just say myself as literally from the Dartu semiotic school. So this is why I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about why this object, this hand-knitted woolen lace become a sign in the local semiosphere. Um, and then, well, I mean, this theory part probably will be a little bit boring, but I will try to make it interesting. And I'll also like just share a little bit about my own theory that I developed from my uh, Shetland uh, field work, because, well, I will talk about this in details later, but it was actually when I went to Shetland in 2020 during COVID time, unfortunately, and I had so like 
such a huge problem of looking for actual lace knitters. And then I realized maybe Shetland lace is not as strong as it, like, I, I mean, the present, like our days Shetland lace is not as strong as it used to be. And I was right because I, kind of had this problem in 2020 and in 2021 uh, while I was still like uh, stuck in Shetland and Shetland lace got uh, the craft itself got onto the endangered uh, actually critically endangered a uh, craft there's a list from the Heritage Craft Association UK uh, currently Shetland is, is not uh, critically endangered but it is it is still endangered uh, so th that that's um about the theory that I developed from my Shetland experience. But that's like all the semiotics and the theory, they're not the core part of today's presentation. Today, I'm actually just going to present a, a selected uh, part of my empirical chapters that is uh, recognizability and the visibility of Shetland hop cellulase. And I will mainly, I will just talk about a uh, like pictures and images I, I've collected for this project. But if we've got some uh, extra time, I will also talk about um, um, the interview transcript. And I will give you my conclusion right from the start. So you like you probably you it's better because you will know what you're expecting. Uh, first, the shared identity is structured by presenting, producing, and valuing lace in cultural landscapes. So here, lace is not just a, it's not just a fabric, but a, a signifier for the signified, um, this Shetland slash Habsalu local identity. So this is why it's so important. And uh, yes, lace serves as the signifier for the signified local identity. That's like se semiotic jargons, but I will try to explain it saying, you know, because I understand probably not all of you from all audience are familiar with the semiotic series. And I really don't want to be that person who just read from the text, it's boring. Um, I also leave some further notes here, mainly about why Shetland lace is endangered now and why, why is uh, Hobbes always still going strong. But let's get going. So why Shetland Habsalu as a pair? Uh, these two uh, hand-knitted wool and lace products, they've got so many similarities. Um, probably knitters in our group will understand what I'm talking about. It's not about a technique or patterns, although they do have some shared patterns. It's really just about the uh, development, the like the pattern, like how lace, uh, how lace started in the 19th century and how people noticed lace and how local people advertised lace, how lace become popular and how like just let, let's long story short, it's really the whole process of how hand knitted woolen lace uh, from uh, being a means of uh, like, you know, a way to make extra income to a really important part of local culture. This this whole pattern is really like the, the these patterns in Shetland and Hobsol, they're really similar to each other. It's almost mirroring, although although there are quite a lot, lot of difficulties, but that's another section of my uh, thesis that probably will be another presentation. So first of all, let's see. People. Uh well. I, I know our seminar today is like not people place products, but this is how I just de describe my project. So kind of like very, very similar to the series um, theme. I will talk about people and because they are like those who need lace, consume lace and treat lace as part of their identity as an understanding of being from Hobsol and being from Shetland. Uh, they are the core uh, figure of my PhD research. And I am interested in how this this knitted lace become part of the local identity, not other things. Uh, also, place Harps of the Shetland. Well, you might like you might wonder why, because it sounds like they do not like it's really far away. Like if you want to go from Shetland to Harps you have to first take that fourteen hour of 12 hours, I cannot remember, ferry to Aberdeen and Aberdeen to Glasgow, wheresoever, fly to Tallinn and take a bus to Habsalu. It's really far away from each other. But actually, and also both Shetland and Habsalu, it's a little bit remote, isn't it? 
But actually, this is kind of false belief, I would argue, because both Shet and Hafsalur, they are like historically and geographically, they served as meeting points of various cultures. It's like really a crossroad of cultures. And if you look at the map of the Hanseatic League, uh, Shet and Hafsalur is like on the both like ends of the Hanseatic League. So they probably have some medieval, uh, it's probably about uh, me me medieval trade heritage, but that's just a side information, not the core information here. Because when Shet when Shetland Lace and Hapsal Lace start, like when these two um, heritage crafts, they started in the beginning of, more or less at the beginning of the 19th century, it was already like not the Hanseatic time. But I mean, the Hanseatic League may just fade away from history, but I believe uh, those trading roads would remain, it, it would just stay there. Um, and also in the 19th century, the timber trade, the herring trade, so the patterns might be traveling back then, but just, uh, you know, it's not a huge part of uh, heterography of that time, because back then, like, people just don't, look at lace that much because it's considered to be a woman's work and it's domestic work is not that important if you think about those 19th century historians and they probably they're just interested in royal family or and the you know the battles so soldiers army stuff and products uh we go back to the beginning of these two lace fabrics they're both created for money it's like very practical reason like people just invented this because yeah it makes money it's not for mundane daily use so uh like for example in estonia uh folk costume is a really important part still now um actually this week is a very important week for estonian folk culture because it's saint martin's day fair time so from tomorrow and i believe till the end of this week it will be saint martin's fair in estonia and you see lots of handicraft items knitted items like for costume. Of course, Habsalu lace would be presented on St. Martin's Fair. But interesting enough, because if you're talking about Estonian knitting, most of them are uh, folk clothing items, like those mittens, those colorful uh, cardigans, woolen jumpers. Uh, but it's really hard to say Habsalu lace. Like now probably you could say, yeah, sometimes people use it with their for costume, but Habsalu lace was never a part of for costume for very, uh, practical reason it's too fragile and it's quite expensive to be honest because it takes lots of working hours to make um, and so it's the share shed lace like they're both too uh, fragile too exquisite for mundane daily use and here are three keywords for my research hand knitted woolen lace as heritage crafts so it's hand knitted I'm not talking about anything that is machine made, but although interesting, like both Shetland and Hapsala is like people mostly like, you know, people are not from Shetland and Hapsala. They attempted to make machine made Shetland Hapsala lace. That my colleague Ro Rosalind Chapman from Glasgow University did massive research about those not Shetland lace, that is not Nordicum lace style. So if you're interested in this aspect, I recommend Rosalind's work. And on the Habsal part, actually, it was um, at the beginning of uh, the Soviet occupation. So Soviet had like huge demand for Habsal lace, and they kind of they wanted local lace knitters to produce more and with lower quality so they could get more quantity. And they also attempted to make hops or lace by machine, but kind of pathetically failed because there's a very uh, distinctive uh, thing on hops or lace. It's called noop in Estonian. It, it means button or like these small bubbles. So even now you can only make noop by hand like this cannot it just simply can, cannot be made by machine. So if you see a piece of hops or lace with noop, that's 100% uh, handmade because of noop. And I'm talking about woolen lace here. So because in my several previous presentations, there's like always a question from the audience talking about Oldenburg lace. So I figured out maybe it's better for me to mention it in my presentation already that I'm not talking about Olenburg lace or anything that is not made with wool. And Olenburg lace from Russia, it's a uh, gold fiber. It's not, it's not wool and lace. 
And also we're talking about Shetland hubs or local identity. So it doesn't make sense to mention Oldenburg Lace if it's not relevant. Although I do I do wrote a lot about like Oldenburg Lace in my thesis, but it's like it's like yes, it it is relevant, but not that relevant. So I'll just say here Oldenburg Lace is not Ulan Lace. And it's about local speciality. It's about something invented, created for money that eventually become part of uh, the lo local semiosphere. And it's not for clothing. It's not everyday wear. It just happened to be something that is made, like designed for someone that do not belong to this place. For example, Hobbs or Lace was designed for those spa goers from uh, upper class from St. Petersburg. It's not for local people. So, but how this kind of completely made for money thing become part of a local identity, that's a very interesting uh, topic to explore. And by the way, these uh, two pictures from Harps of Lace Center and Ernst Heritage Center and very exquisite lace samples. Uh, these are my core research questions of the thesis. Uh, I look at how people work on lace products and how lace product, well, work on people or influence uh, have impact on people and for the first question i just explore the different usage of lace and then business activity patterns and means of promotion and the second i look at um, you know how it develop as uh, how it helped to develop a shared local identity in communities uh, this is like the the shared local identity in local communities uh, part that i'm explaining today and also symbolizing the distinctive localness in marginalized areas. Although I have a huge question, like what do we mean when we mention like remote area, like Shetland, you may think, okay, Sh Shetland is so remote, but actually for Shetlanders or people who live in Shetland, Shetland is not remote, London is remote. So I guess this is a, a, again about the positionality and also like back to my, um, argument that uh, they shouldn't be treated as marginalized areas they actually they were on the like crossroad of different cultures they're like they're the metropolitan area although so sounds remote i understand and also attracting attention from the outside world but then who are the outside world and why they need this attention like why they need this, uh, you know people to look at hubs or lace shit of course for money but maybe they, like for money in the 19th century, but now after all these years, maybe something's changed. So uh, again, I mentioned, I've got like five empirical themes in my thesis that would be made public. Uh, I don't know when, but yeah, it, it will be made pu public eventually. I'm going to talk about recognizability and visibility today and the rest uh, like there, three extra themes, uh, exclusivity, retrocity, and longevity. Uh, I'm just going to explain what is this recognizability and the visibility. It's actually a different aspect of how like lace uh, being represented in the cultural landscape. So I got this, um, this thing from my thesis, uh, just a second, because I need to look at it. So. Uh, the subject for recognizability theme is for the, it's like the out outsiders, how they look at a uh, record, like how they go to say, go to Habsalu and go to Shetland and how do they discover lace? Like, of course they, lace do not need to be discovered by the out outsiders, but how would you see, like how would lace give you the first impression in the landscape? So it will be recognized. So the position, point here is like outsider to discovering landscape. And for visibility, um, as I just mentioned here, uh, the subject is the insiders. So local people of Shetland and Habsalu. So the positioning here is like slightly different from the recognizability. It's about locals to make lace as part of landscape, how locals present lace, how locals make lace visible. Um, and there's three like extra themes. I'm just going to go through it very quickly. So from this recognizability and the visibility, we would just come to the third one, exclusivity. So it gives a reason for the first two themes. Like, yes, we, we've got recognizability and visibility here, but why? Because this list is, is exclusively good. So 
because it's good. So it's recognizable for the outsiders and also insiders. They're willing to make the lace become visible. And for this uh, extremely good lace, we explain it by this virtual city, because as I just, all these citations are from my thesis, uh, because the masters, the skilled knitters are the people who made hand knitted wooden lace being such a exclusive, um, uh, just lo lo luxury item, right? And then we come to this long longevity, uh, so it's about the heritage craft role of lace knitting in local cultural contexts. And from this theme, we could discover a little bit like how to keep lace stay alive. So uh, today's presentation is about recognizability and visibility. As I mentioned, uh, the recognizability theme serves to explain the existence of lace as a cultural symbol in Shetland and half of landscape and cultural sphere. Um, and uh, or also how lace acts as a recognizable recognizable element to outsiders for understanding Shetland and Harp's local identity. And for the visibility theme, this is designed for explaining how lace is presented by local people as a crucial part of Shetland and Harp's cultural settings. Or let's say how local people work on um, um, increasing lace visibility. So if the previous theme mainly shows how lace works on people, then this theme mainly shows how people work on lace. So this go like this would lead everything back to my core research questions. And of course, we're talking about science here. So I'm just going to go through the semiotics part. Um, so I was exploring this hand knitted woolen lace fabric as part of the semiosphere of Harpsolness and Shetlandness, which is just local identities. So first I presented uh Lotman's argument on cultural texts. So hand-knitted lace can be deemed a means of communication both between knitters and the land, which in this case, Habsalu and Shetland. And also the outside observer and the observed land. So how people look at the land and how this reflect back. And also it can be used as a symbol when, because we are when we are talking about this local identity, we cannot really see it, we cannot really touch it. So it's like rather intangible. So it needs a tangible representative to be presented in wider cultural context, uh, contexts. So this is how Hapsal and the Shetland lace carry me meanings. And this is how they become the signifiers for the signified Hapsal and Shetland identities. There's another uh, citation here. Uh, pretty old, but anyway, uh, it's on social semiotics. So the signs that are related to hand knitted, like this is just my explanation. It's not his uh, ar argument, but I just, I made this ar argument based on their argument. So the signs that are related to hand knitted lace, like not only lace, but also lace pieces, stories uh, surrounded and technique notes and the people who engage in the life cycle of lace, photos, museum descriptions, museum items, these things. This all should, uh, like this all, all of the things are like having their own semiotic importance. So I'm not only studying lace fabric here, but also all the meanings around it, uh, like around lace. So this is how hand knitted lace become part of the semiosphere or science pool for both Harpsalu and Shetland. And then the last one regarding identity. So hand knitted lace can be seen as a cultural symbol that not only distinguishes Habsalu and Shetland from their own home countries, but also explains the importance of having a mixed identity in these two places. So it's about why it is important because Shetland and Habsalu, people want to, it, like they want to present their distinctive local identity that is different from Scottish identity and Estonia identity. Like for Shetland, it's like Scottish with, I put Norwegian influences down, but really just overall as why so-called Viking influences. And for Habsalu, it's a place in Estonia with fairly strong Swedish influences. And by the way, I think like next year there would be a Swedish sound festival, like sound festival for Swedish minorities in Estonia that would be happening in Habsalu if I remembered right. Um, yeah, so that's really 
uh, what follows regarding the semiotics part. And also I mentioned some texts about this uh, nostalgic object and the meanings of folk crafts. Uh, like they, I think Luton was uh, exploring the Finnish, Finnish jumper, and one of the argument was that it was not the jumper itself, but memories surrounded that made the jumper a core element, uh, which makes sense in this uh, identity thing. So it's again about f formation of local or like. Well, the Finnish case was the national identities, but they're all identities. So uh, because they are shared memory and understanding of localness within community, so we could see like by forming and shaping the image of lace, the distinction which separates local identity from others, like this core uh, element others, this is how like just to split self and others, this is where the identity thing starts. And this is the willpowering mechanism that I uh, it, like I designed in Shetland, actually. No, I actually designed this in Estonia, in Dartu, but it was based on my Shetland question that why I had so like, so like such a strange experience of having such a huge difficulty of looking for lace knitters where I, before I go to Shetland, I thought it would be really easy task. Um, but I think we should skip here because this is not the, the key, uh, like this is really just something I happen to, well, we will come back if we have enough time because I see it's a, like, it's a bit, time flies when you talk about lace. Right, um, now I could start with this recognizability theme on the Shetland side. Uh, on, on the screen, you could see a picture that is quite famous, actually. Uh, if you are in this low, uh, like online knitting groups or really just online, like uh, this knitted lace fence, uh, like time to time, it's not that new actually, but time to time it will just pop up on the, on the uh, timelines because it's very special. And it looks like really, because this is, Shetland lace product, but it's not Shetland lace. It's actually, it's not even made with wool. So um, in my thesis, I wrote about it. I'm just going to read from it. So it's the famous Anne Junson fence. It's uh, something knitted by a lady called Anne Junson. And this picture is, uh, this lace now is placed in front of the Shetland Textile Museum. So according to the museum description, which is placed next to the fence, you cannot see it on this. Oh, maybe you could see it, but you cannot read from this picture. Uh, the motivation for Anne Junson knitting this fence in 2012 is simply to replace the ugly fence she had around her garden. However, in 2018, the Shetland Textile Museum considered that it would be fun to have an example of Anne's not so fine lace for our own fence upon the occasion of a fine Shetland lace exhibition. Then this piece of not so fine lace with print and a wave pattern, knitted with fishing twine as material and curtain poles as needles, just ended up staying in front of the Shetland Textile Museum as an attraction and part of landscape. This is actually from the museum description. They explained like why is not so fine laces here and why uh, it's important because it would be interesting to have it after this local lace exhibition. And actually it's really, really recognizable because that's literally the first thing you would see if you go to the Shetland um, Textile Museum. And I guess the recognizability here is pretty straightforward. Like you go to museum, you see the lace, you recognize, oh, okay, this is something special because they put it here in giant scale and about Shetland. And this is another example. So apart from Anne Junson's famous lace fence, here, uh, actually this is part of a project called Miri Lace by Roxanne Palma from University of Highland and Ireland, Shetland College. It's a light in installation and also a community project 
uh, and now you could you if you go to Shetland, you could go to Mario to see. Well, by the way, Mario is the UK's most northerly cinema and art center. It's in Lovick. So if you go to Mario and you could see this lace. Um, I think this is also an appropriate example for demonstrating Shetland lace recognizability in public space. So in in Roxham Palmas onwards, this light in 2013, my city, uh, this is cited from uh, the cells. So this light installation is designed to celebrate Shetland's culture of knitting and craft with an aim of bringing communities together through their shared past to make the most of an exceptional textile legacy. So it's actually a, commi uh, it's a commission from Shetland Arts and uh, Roxanne Palmer, she, she made a really fantastic presentation about this project recently. And I'm not sure if it's recorded, but it, it, if it's recorded, I highly recommend you to check it out. Yes, and we've seen uh, not so fine lace, a giant scale lace, uh, this lace that you cannot really touch, it's just a shadow of lace. And they're all in the public sphere. And uh, also like you could see, although I'm talking about recognizability here, but why I put recognizability and the visibility together because all recognizability has something to do with visibility. Um, because lo local people put it there so that you, go to the local and you discover this from the local landscape. And also this is about lace become part of the local identity that would be placed on an individual's body as a signifier. And this example is from Angela Irvin, a local uh, craftsperson. So this is her clothing design using Shetland lace on silk, uh, on silk dress. So by the way, this design is on exhibition at the Shetland Museum at the moment. So uh, let me see, you could see from this, um, this label that I discovered in a local clothing shop. Uh, she explained this is inspired by Shetland's nature and heritage. So the landscape or the sea view print on the silk material represents Shetland's unique nature with the knitted lace fabric here represents lace as heritage crafts in Shetland's cultural context. So I think, yeah, in like it just work with each other. Like this is part of the Shet Shetland nature landscape and part of Shetland's uh, culture land landscape. So uh, the artist just happened to put these two elements together. And here, this is a uh, work from another local artist called Helen Robertson, a very talented lace knitter. And also she's a jewelry designer. Um, she employs Shetland lace knitting frequently in representing local identity. Uh, her inspirations from her own words that you could find it, uh, you could see from her own uh, hannahrobertson.com or something, her own website. So uh, she claims that her inspiration is from Shetland's textile history and natural heritage. Um, because she's a native uh, Shetlander. So how she describes her work would be interesting to see how the material is used to, to present part of the identity. And by the way, um, so the symbolical value of Shetland lace in Shetland culture sphere is also not only just from the museum, like not the, the just museum or uh, cultural presentation in, um, uh, you know, those proper places. You could just really see it everywhere. Here on the screen, I show you a thing that I bought it. I forgot I bought it from where, but I'm pretty sure if you go to Shetland now, you could find it somewhere in a souvenir shop. They've got quite a few over there. It's Shetland Tea Tower. And so this is really something designed that is meant to attract tourists. But then making lace into these everyday items is also quite interesting because why lace here? Uh, this is lace, but not, this is also fabric, but not lace fabric. It's lace printed on fabric as in a form of being a cultural symbol, not being lace itself. This tea towel is not lace. 
and also like lay the the abstractive lace uh, can be found uh, not only in tea tower this and that uh, it's like tea tower because tea tower is like steel um, fabric but here you could see like lace dishes uh, it's not fabric anymore it's like glassware so when the like so my argument is like Shetland lace this word which sounds like just for a certain fabric, but actually because it carries the cultural meaning, the symbolism, uh, the abstractive uh, idea of Shetland lace as part of Shetland identity can be found like in various types of um, material, not only just fa fabric or lace. And also you could see this as part of, um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, part of people's everyday or not everyday like festival wear. So this is um, uh, this is a picture from uh, Shetland News, I believe. Um, on the picture, you could see the famous Shetland celebrity uh, comedian Marilyn Robertson. So she won the Scots Speaker of the Year award in two thousand in two thousand twenty two. So last year. And she she was wearing a Shetland lace shawl as part of her ceremonial attire, and uh, she wrote about this actually on her Twitter account. Here I'm wearing a Shetland lace hat knitted by my grandmother, taking a piece of ham at our words. I really cannot do Shetland accent, but she wrote it in uh, Shetland dialect. Um. So according to her own words, this piece of lace means a piece of home to her. So it's really, again, here, it's not about lace, but about something else. After talking about Shetland lace, I think I should hurry up to explain the Hobsolo part. We are still on the recognizability part. Um, here on the first picture, you can see uh, this is in the Mod Spa in Hobsolo. And you could see Shetland lace patterns presented on the window as, uh, you know, it's something printed. So I wrote in my thesis, this picture was taken in the historic therapeutic mud spa treatment room of Formale Salasu Spa. It shows that the window is covered with a layer of film with hops and lace prints so that the mud spa client could have some privacy when being covered in a thick layer of dark, dark sea mud with its um, really unpleasant smell, to be honest. Um, so, Although it's like in a spa room, you don't really need hand-knitted woolen lace fabric, but because this hand-knitted woolen fabric is so important for local semiosphere or just lo as a local culture symbol. So to remind you that you are in Hapsalu, having a proper mud spa treatment, like those holiday goers in the 19th century, uh, to remind you this fact, they put this, like they just, somehow designed this uh, Hapsal element into this spa sphere. Also, you could see a uh, Hapsal lace place as part of the local environment or landscape. So if you just take a short walk around the town center, it's highly likely you will just spot more than like man in many places in Hapsal town, you could spot uh, this Hapsal lace being, being presented as part of their environment this is not a shop window it's someone's home i believe and but here's also like one picture this is from a shop window in Hapsalu, a handicraft shop so Hapsalu lace is used as um you know a window decoration pretty common one and which is also a quite interesting detail if you think like if you think in depth like this actually shows that lace knitting skill is pretty popular and pretty on an everyday level because if you just buy a piece of lace it's very expensive and you're not going to you you use it on your window but why i actually got this uh, idea from one of my colleague with whom i went to hop salute together and my co colleague no noticed that she was like oh local people they must know how to knit lace, lace because you probably won't spend that much um money on an item just put on just put it on your window and I do agree and from my further investigation and my interviews it shows that because in Hapsalu they just they put uh, lace knitting like they just 
included it in the local curriculum. So you will have to learn how to knit lace uh, in order to graduate from, uh, from the school. Right, and here is an archival picture. This is one photo of the 1940s hops of lace in archives. Reference number is EFA.706.10.15374. In case anyone wants to check it in the archives. And the description goes in Estonian, but I will just uh, say it in English. Estonians escape from homeland Refugee life in Sweden in words and photos. So here it's a piece of hops and lace, but uh, it's also part of representation of refugee life in Sweden. Uh, so here, like hops and shawl, it's being used as an indicator of identity. Um, so if you think back, like in the 19th century, the function is more about you know, just make lace and uh, sell it to the holiday goers, make it somehow a part of local product. But here, at the beginning of the 20th century, hops or lace uh, just started from being part of the lo local product to part of um, uh, local just un understanding of self uh, representation and identity. And here comes a picture that I took on the on on the ship not not Shetland, sorry on the hops of lace day in twenty twenty two. Uh, if you just have a look, how many people are wearing hops of lace here? Pretty a lot. It's not necessarily like maybe not all of them are from Hapsalu, but because but because they come to Hapsalu, so they made this Hapsalu and Hapsalu lace. It's like so tightly knitted and uh, to a local identity. So to come to Hopsalo, you would show something that has got lace involved. So in this way, lace become also part of the local landscape. And we're going to the visibility here. So after uh, recognizability, which is how like about how outsiders recognize lace in the cultural landscape. Here, visibility is about lo how locals present uh, lace in like in museum in their ways. And here you could see um, this is a portrait of Arthur and Anderson in a Shetland Textile Museum. So you could see his portrait is placed in the middle of two stockings. So yeah, because he was the middleman, he introduced the lace to Queen Victoria. According to the museum narrative, Arthur Anderson served as a director of p o shipping line and Shetland's liberal MP when he presented the young Queen Victoria with a pair of stockings in 1837. However, the story tells us that Arthur Anderson, despite being a director and MP, which shows a rather privileged social status, he did not pay Shetland knitters who are almost certainly on the less privileged side compared to Arthur Anderson himself. He did not pay them for their labor. He, uh, well, this is really just uh, something about uh, him saying, yeah, this payment, uh, the, 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 these are just samples gifted to the queen and this and that. But it's quite interesting because this visibility shows that the link between Shetland lace and the middleman who sold Shetland lace to the queen, and also thus is uh, started an era of Shetland lace having a link to the royal family. I think this presentation is really interesting. It also gives an idea like why this lace is so important in the local identity. And also here is in the same mu museum, because by the way, when I was in Shetland, uh, it, it was during the COVID time, so time was slightly different. And also there's a parallel research uh, project going on. So I did not really get to see much lace in the actual Shetland Museum, which you could see now, but I went to Sh Shetland Textile Museum and they also got quite good lace examples. And here's like about la how they presented lace as part of the human life circle. And this is also a part of the Shetland Textile Museum. So this is about how lace become part of uh, 
everyday life. So from the life circle to life itself, and also come to a uh, contemporary use of Shetland lace, which means it's not only just a museum object, it's also like it exists now, uh, still alive, still uh, changing and, uh, you know, getting new motif, getting new designs, which means because if something just stay as uh, how it was in the 19th century or whatsoever, it means it's dead. It belongs to museum. Only one thing that goes like as like new inspirations and new designs, I think this is a symbol of a certain heritage craft is still alive. And this you could see it uh, hand knitted and beaded in one ply lace wool by Hazel Lawrenson of Ernst. Highly recommended entry in the neckwear competition in 2016. So pretty recent. And here is a picture I took on the high, uh, high street of uh, Lerwick. I believe this was in Anderson's shop. This is not Jamieson's. And you could see the Shetland lace is still very much like it, it has got visibility and you could still buy it not only like it's not just a museum item you could actually buy it from high street and here on the left is a picture that i took from jameson and smith they, they've got a shop in lovick and um it's a piece of lace scarf and you could just buy from them but actually there's some other stories about this uh, scarf because that was i took this picture while i was investigating when I was investigating lace price in Shetland and I discovered actually, uh, and I argued in my thesis that one core reason that why Shetland lace is not as uh, the vitality level is like much lower on the Shetland part than the Hapsal part is because Hapsal lace is more properly priced whereas Shetland lace, they just sell it at a rather cheap price. Um, not only can like you 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 can buy lace pieces from um, Anderson Jamieson's like everywhere on the Shetland uh, High Street. You could also buy like Shetland lace inspired decorations from the shop, uh, because local people just put lace there, and you could, cause it's all made like in the community. So the business pattern goes like niches would bring their things to the shop, and the shop would charge a part. Uh, from what I know, it's like 25%, and then the 75% goes to the knitter themselves. But di different shops, they might have like the different, uh, you know, percentage. And because this is a little bit awkward topic to uh, ask around, like, just go around and ask the shop owners, how much did you get from this? Uh, but I still got this figure that I can, I, I probably shouldn't say from which shop, but it's like about 25%. Uh, so that the uh, local knitters would just present their work and they would get additional income. And here's a picture I took and um, actually in Ernst and in a pretty hard to reach place. And you could see they were se selling fine Shetland lace cards uh, with a sample of Shetland lace on the cover. And it was £7.99 and £7.99 in 2021, so now probably more expensive. Okay, now it's a uh, final part of today's um, presentation. I'm going to talk about the visibility out of uh, Hapsalu lines. Let me get my notes here. So this is a picture that I took in the Estonian Open Air Museum. It's not in Hapsalu, it's in Dalim. Um, it, it was during a May Fair event. So, the setting is a costumed short play performed by museum staff members. It shows a gathering about education-related matters in an interwar period setting. And from the picture, it is clear to see that both ladies are dressed in hops or lace scarf. In this play, hops or lace is used as a symbol for nationally-minded intellectuals. It communicates in a way that first, these ladies are well-educated with proper taste, and second, these ladies are using harps or lace to express an Estonian identity. So not just harps or identity. And here's another picture that I took at the Darling Leonard Mary International Airport. So on the left side of the photo, you could see two piles of harps or lace fabrics. Like they're just, you know, 
it just part of the souvenir. And by the way, here's a tiny little point on this on this uh, photo. Uh, those unboxed uh, Habsalo lace pieces, honestly, I don't think it should be called as Habsalo lace, but more Habsalo inspired pieces. Was the boxed one, the uh, the proper one. So in case if you're going to Darling and if you want to buy authentic hops or lace, maybe just go for the boxed one. And I, I I explained why in my thesis, but we don't have time to talk about it today. Um, so you could see that yeah, it shows that hops or lace is being promoted as a representative of Estonian heritage candy craft, and also somehow uh just stereotypical souvenir or maybe stereotypical is not a good word but i just want to say it's just if you want something estonian souvenir you probably will go for hapsalo lace even though you're not visiting hapsalo but darling and also there are different quality level for hapsalo lace so if you want to have better quality you just go for the standardized boxed one and if you just want a piece of lace then you just go to the hapsalo inspired ones and so the, the, these two, like in the Estonian Open Air Museum and uh, Leonard Mary Airport, it's about how lace being like the visibility of lace in without a Habsalo context is actually not in Habsalo. But here we come back to Habsalo. So you could see this is a picture I've taken in, uh, in front of the Habsalo Lace Center. And it's really very straightforward it's a lace center so we have a piece of lace on on the window and you probably cannot see very clearly here because it's like white on white but it says Habsalu on this piece of lace um like on the top part uh it's you know those characters are just made with noop the small bubbles and uh, you could also see a very uh, typical Hops of lace pattern with this Estonian star on this uh, piece. So this is how like local people present this as part of their like localness. Yes, we are in Hapsalo now, so we we could see lace in the landscape. And also, uh, Hapsalo local people they made lace somehow a very strong um point of their localness. So. I would argue that the biggest event in Habsalo is uh, White Lady Days in August. It has got uh, like me, me, um, a medieval reference. The White Lady is actually a ghost, so this is why the White Lady Days always fall on the on the full moon of August. But here you could see that this is the uh, Habsalo lace knitting night during the. Uh, the white lady days event so it shows literally how people work on lace they're not only just hops uh, local knitters but also knitters traveling from elsewhere from other parts of estonia but they all come to hops and like they all all worked on this visibility thing for presenting this hops culture element so this is again about how people uh, explain and present lace in a cultural uh, atmosphere. So, okay, this is again about the willpower mechanism. I'm not sure if I have enough time. So if we have, we will come back to this, but I just wanted to uh, go to the con conclusion part now and uh, give some further notes. So after this, uh, things that I only presented the, the picture part of these two sections. And if when my thesis become public, if you're interested, you could go to my thesis and you could see the, the in interview transcripts here. Lace obviously acts as a signifier for the signified localness and, uh, and the shared identity is structured by presenting. You could see like, yeah, um, like how they present, how local people present, and how they present so that the outsiders could see it in the uh, like in this context, and they produce lace and also produce meanings of lace, and also they value lace uh, because otherwise it won't be placed on such a uh, high um, like the status of lace in both places are both 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 very high despite. Hops of uh, Shetland lace currently is endangered. That's another topic. Um, 
I just want to say that, yeah, and everything just works together in this shared cultural landscape. So I've got some uh, further notes. This is one question I discovered during my field work, so it's not planned, but you know, ethnographic field work always come with surprises. Some surprises are good, some surprises are pretty much surprise. So I wondered why Hobson lace still going strong while Shetland lace is currently endangered. And when I was in my field, it was critically endangered. And that's why I made that well powering mechanism to explain this and to give an idea of how this heritage craft, uh, the evolution process of heritage craft that I hope we will have time, if not today, maybe next time I could explain further. So thank you very much. I think that's all for today. And here are my context, uh, my, my contact details. And if you've got further question that we cannot solve or like, I know we've got like very limited time today. So you're welcome to contact me. And I'm always happy to talk more about Harpsol and Shetland. And by the way, I actually, I prepare this for every presentation that I make for these Hapsalo and the Share Shet and Lace presentations, but I hope it works now, but uh, it's actually just a video clip about how it looks to sell to Ernst in November. And why I put this as the uh, end of my uh, presentation, because I just want to explain, uh, I just want to show how this local landscape makes sense when we are going to talk about um, heritage craft. Because, I, well, of course, I'm not just putting this to show, wow, the, my field work has been such a tough experience. Thankfully, I, I don't have anything like CC or so on. It's fine. It, it was really fine. But I just want to say, like, if you look at this C condition, I'm not sure if that's just me, but it somehow it looks like lace pattern. And there are lace patterns, like classical Shetland lace pattern that has like in, in, inspired by the wave. I, actually, I think if I'm right, I think that famous Anne Yunsen uh, fence is knitted with some um, wave pad pattern, but I, I might be wrong. I have to double check on this one. But I just want to say like, um, here is the connection in my eyes that why this lace has become like such an important figure in the local semiosphere or cultural landscape, you name it, because it's connected to people's everyday life. And then by attaching memories, stories, and local lores, and also ex shared experiences, all these meanings together, it constructed uh, the hand-knitted wool and lace fabric that are not, like these fabrics are not fabrics anymore, but symbols in a broader sense. And this is why it can represent um, local identity. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you.